and everybody that's tuning in online at an evening for the books.com. And a special thank you to Mrs. Mika Sofer of COLLive.com for promoting tonight's program and for everything that she does for our community. Thank you. I'd like to thank a few sponsors, individuals who made tonight's beautiful event possible. Many of them is not only tonight, but as well as Chafav, Vav Tishrei, Beis Abenu, and many other beautiful programs for the Crown Heights community. Thank you, Beis Shmuel Chavad, headed by Rabbi Meishi Pinson. Three dear friends, Yassi, Yassi and Nechamadina Katz, Zalmi and Sarla Cohen, Shlemi and Mirla Greenwald for always being there without, without any questions, always making their funds available for these beautiful events for the Crown Heights community. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Yerachmiel and Rifka Leah Jacobson, Zalman and Mrs. Mimi Felig of Miami, Florida. Maybe the Avishter bench you for everything that you need. Thank you, Ari and Malki Sperlin, Nussi and Gitti Sternberg, Mendel and Sarah Lapinson, and last but not least, Srili and Eliza Shachat of California. While tonight is an evening for the books, it's actually for the books and then followed by by the books, as in B-U-Y. There's a sale at Kahas right across the street, up to 50% off, open up until till midnight tonight and tomorrow night, and as far as I understand, throughout the weekend. If you're not able to go there in person, those watching online can order at kahas.com. This is one of the Rebbe's instructions to buy and to fix farm and to expand libraries individually and in the community and especially the Rebbe's library. So it's definitely something that it should be followed up with. Also, at an eveningforthebooks.com, be sure after watching tonight's program and participating, whether you're online or here in person, to fill out the duch to notify the Rebbe of good news, Sir Stavis, that we gather together as a community, united as one, to, to learn and to celebrate this special, about this special day. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome one of the Rebbe's Chazim and Menichim, whose birthday happens to be today as well, so a special happy birthday, <laughs> Rabbi Simon Jacobson. Good Yontif. Thank you very much for your kind words, and I want to personally thank Menachem Ben Shimon for this beautiful, elegant evening honoring in a befitting way what the Rebbe calls a Yames Gula and a Ace Rotzen, an auspicious day. <laughs> an auspicious day and a day that the doors of opportunity are open for us. Hey, Tavis. A number of years ago, I was invited to a panel, speak for a secular audience. It was officially called an evening of literature. And one of the organizers asked me to join. Three of us, there was a professor on modern literature, there was a Shakespearean scholar, and myself. An interesting mix. And each of us brought one book to present, a book that was dear to us. So the Shakespearean scholar brought his book. The, uh, the modern literature scholar brought another book. And I brought a Sefer. We're sitting there on the dais. The table where we were sitting at, where the books were sitting or resting on, was a little shaky. And I saw its leg was at the edge. And there it goes. It uh, falls over. And all the three Lahavdal books fell up to the stage. And each of us, of course, picked up our Sefer. I picked up my Sefer, they picked up their books. And I, nonchalantly, I gave the Sefer a kiss. The moderator, and many people in the audience, noticed that. So the evening began with the moderator saying, we all noticed that you kissed your book. And the others did not. Can you explain why? And I felt, I said, God is ready before the event began 
I didn't have to say anything. Just explaining that would already uh, tell the whole story. Now, it was not toward a meaningful life. <laughs> it was a Tanya. It was a Tanya. And I said, yes. The reason I kissed it was because we don't see a book as a book of words on a page, not even ideas. A book is a life, a living, breathing organism in whose every word is saturated with the soul of the author who inscribed his soul into that book. And a life, you kiss a life, you cherish it. On Simcha's Torah, I explained, we dance with Torah scrolls. I'm sure none of you dance with your books. And in more sad times, heaven protect us, when synagogues were lit by anti-Semites, Jews ran into the buildings, not just to save lives, to pull the Torah scrolls out of the ark. It seems a very strange thing to do, to endanger yourself for a book in an ark. There are many other Torah scrolls. You can always write a new one. But we didn't see Torah scrolls as books. They were irreplaceable. Chayenu ve'erechmenu, I explained. It's our life and our sustenance. Teres chayim. These Torah scrolls and all these Torah books have traveled with us, the Jewish people, for over 3,000 years. In thick and thin, it gave us hope, strength, guidance, spiritual sustenance, in every possible way. So we dance with it, we kiss it, we embrace it. I can tell you the audience was visibly moved. And let me just tell you what happened at the end of the evening. A woman came over to me, a young woman, with tears in her eyes. And she said, first time I understand something. I had a grandfather who was a Holocaust survivor. And when he passed away, till this day, he instructed us, gave us a little piece of parchment, had a few Hebrew letters on it, and said, every Friday night, please kiss this parchment. It's something that traveled with me through the darkest times in the Holocaust. And now I understand why. So this is a secret that we know, the secret of Nitzchi Yisateda, the eternity of Teda. It's a life, it's not a book. Hey Tevis, my Hey Tevis, the Gemara asks, my Hanukkah, my Hey Tevis, what's Hey Tevis? Hey Tevis is a celebration of the true significance of a Sefer. Celebration of the true significance of a Rebbe. The true significance of the Rebbe's connection with us, with his Chassidim. When the Friedrich Rebbe left Russia, he would not leave endangering himself and his family without the Svarim, without the manuscripts. Because for him it wasn't manuscripts. It was his father and his grandfather and his great-grandfather and the great-great-grandfather all the way back to Moshe Rabbeinu. It's part of the family. As Teda is one of our family. The Rebbe always referred to Pidyan Shvuim when books were freed. Books. Pidyan Shvuim is an expression we use on lives. People who are captive, but the books are lives. So hey, Tevis, that's what we celebrate. We celebrate that a book is a life, not just words. A Rebbe is not just a private citizen or an administrator or a spiritual leader, a charismatic teacher, a scholar, a sage, all of that. But above all, a Rebbe is a selfless, transparent channel of what God wants us to be in this world. A Rebbe's Chayim Ruchniyim, spiritual life, Ave, Yira, and Amuna, personifies that, what we call Bittl, and therefore serves as a complete role model and a channel for us to live up to our calling of what God wants of us. The Judge Sifton recognized that, and therefore when you put these two together, a Sefer being a life, and a Rebbe being a selfless, entity, not a private citizen, what do you have? The Rebetzin's answer that was a defining linchpin in the winning victory. And what was it when they asked her at the end of the deposition? So who did the Svarim books belong to? The Chassidim of the Rebbe. So she answered, the books, the Svarim. And the Rebbe himself belonged to the Chassidim. This was never ever documented in a secular court, such a statement. Everybody's a private citizen. Everybody has property. Everybody has family. 
But the judge recognized that higher truth, an eternal truth. And therefore, our bond with the Rebbe is an eternal bond in that sense. Just imagine. This is a Chaz Sholem scenario, but just imagine. Moshe Rabbeinu comes down from Har Sinai. He brings us the Torah. Torah Sivalonu Moshe. Kibble Messinai. Forty years later, Moshe's soul is ascending on high. Imagine his children and grandchildren suddenly say, hey, our father and grandfather, it's his words. We own them. We're the legal heirs. What would have happened? You know, maybe we'll give you permission to use it. Maybe you pay us royalties. Maybe not. What would have happened? God forbid, God forbid. There would be no Torah today. Moshe is not a private citizen. He's a man of God. And the Sefer Torah and the Torah is not a book. It's a life. And a life that is, lives on through us. So then when you ask, how do you celebrate Hey Tevis? The Rebbe said it very clear. The Sephardim themselves tell you how to celebrate. You celebrate it by bringing them alive. By not just reading them, studying them. Living with them. Following their guidelines. The more we live, the more we are guided by them, the more they come alive. And the Rebbe that's inscribed in them comes alive. So action. What's the action plan of Hey Tevis? Six points that Rebbe primarily makes real action. Number one, then from here on, from Hey Tevis on, 33 years ago, when this was ratified in a federal court of law, the power of a Teda, of a Sefer, the power of a Rebbe, and our relationship with it. Number one, to increase in Teda study. Kviyasitim the Teda. But not just study, living with it. Encouraging others to do the same. Number two, Acquiring Svarim, purchasing Svarim. And the Rebbe emphasized there should be a discount, there should be a sale around Hay Tavis. Number three, purchasing Svarim also as gifts, gifts for chas and kalas, brides and grooms, or for children, special occasions. Number four, building a library, taking your house, buy your smallest Svarim, filling your house in every room with the basic books and, the, and one large room with all the books, as many as possible. The basic is Siddur, Chumash, Tilim, Tanya, Sifre Halacha, Medrash. We have a body, there's books, there's thousands and thousands of Svarim. And finally, number six is, number five, I should say, is building libraries everywhere. And number six is to contribute Svarim to the Sifre, the, base, the library of Agudis Chidi Chabad, which houses the Svarim that were determined on Hay Tavis to belong to the Chassidim. So on this special day, we seek to honor and to celebrate and to strengthen our bond with the Rabbeim. So what more appropriate way is by actually doing that, looking into their Torah, reading it, but living with it, coming away with a living message demonstrating its relevance to our lives. And by doing that, they come alive through us. So, what we will do is go through, the, from the Baal Shem Tov, Miyasr of Tezis Chesid Chabad, all the way to the Rebbe, and do exactly that. Look into the soul of the book, which is the soul of the Rebbe. So my friends, let us all take a journey. We're taking a journey into the Svarim and into the souls that are inscribed in this Svarim. Anon nafshis kovis Yehovis. Hashem said that. The first word of the Aseres Adibris, which is the basis of all the Torah, is an acronym, Anoichi. Anon nafshis kovis Yehovis. I have infused, I have inscribed my soul in these words that I give you. And Sadikim deim lebeiram, Sadikim do exactly the same. Now, to truly appreciate a sefer, to truly appreciate a teaching, it's always healthy and wise to see why was this teaching taught and when was it taught? What challenge, what issue was it coming to address? So let's begin our journey to the end, to end of the 17th century. The end of the 17th century, the birth of the Baal Shem Tov, 1698, and the beginning of the 18th century. What was the world experiencing? It was the beginning of the modern age. The world we have today began to be determined and defined in that period. 
after the Renaissance and the so-called Enlightenment, which challenged long-held beliefs and systems and establishments, a new period opened up, free inquiry. And it changed much. And for Jews in particular, it has deep impact. Because the emancipation of the Jews now is a new modern world that they have to deal with. How do you deal with that? And it was especially dire time because it was just 50 years after Gzeda's Tachvetat, Somlensky, who led hordes of Cossacks, killing hundreds of thousands of Jews in European communities. It was 30 years after the fiasco, the tragedy of Shabtai Tzvi that led and picked up people's hopes and then shattered. The Jews were broken. Their spirits were demoralized. You can say it was the beginning of dichotomies. The dichotomy between God and this universe, between faith and reason, between science and religion. And for Jews, the dichotomy between academic Torah and passionate Judaism, between the body and soul, the neshama and the goof of Torah, between scholars and laymen. Many dichotomies were born in that period of time. And that's the landscape, that's the backdrop where the Baal Shem Tov enters. The Abish says, Magdim Rafu Lamaka. Before the illness, he gives us the cure, and Chassidus was born. Chassidus was born, the Baal Shem Tov, 36 years in the year 1734. The Baal Shem Tov comes on the scene, and what does he teach? He teaches there are no dichotomies. Hashem Echod doesn't mean just one God, it means one reality. The divine is everywhere. Every fiber of existence, as the Alter Rebbe brings the Torah of the Baal Shem Tov right in the beginning of Shai Yechid Vamuna, La'elam Hashem Dvarchav Nitzav B'Shamayim, that the words of God are always and perpetually vivifying every detail, every iota of existence. It's concealed, but it's waiting to be released by us, because the concealment is only from our perspective. What is the consequences of that? There are no dichotomies. There was a school of thought that at one point said, you know what, we can't reconcile these two worlds, Judaism and the modern world, faith and modernity. And that, that uh, school of thought claimed, in the words they used, a Jew at home, a guy in the street, compartmentalization. On the other extreme, there were those that said, fine, the ghetto walls are coming down, but we have to create our own blinders because the hostile world is a threat. The Baal Shem Tov and Chassidus comes and teaches, no, no. The world is not a threat because the world is created by God. And when you're able to access and dig deeper, you'll find godliness everywhere. And hence the Baal Shem Tov says, from everything that a man, a person sees or hears, there's a lesson. Everything. Everything is divine providence. A leaf turning in the wind is divine providence. So there's no detail in life that is not subject to some divine plan. Famous story with Rabbi Chaim Rappaport, where the Baal Shem Tov had the simcha because the Chaim Rappaport took a drink of water. And he said, that water was waiting from the beginning of time for you to make a brach on it. Imagine now, let's live with that in our own lives, that when you walk the streets, wherever you go, God leads your footsteps. And every interaction, every encounter could be that from the beginning of time was waiting for you or I or any one of us to utilize for some higher purpose. How does that infuse our lives? That challenged and that was countering the demoralization and the broken spirits of the Jews because it invoked a deeper look at everything. Just as the Baal Shem Tov showed and revealed the divine within everything in existence, he also reveal the divine within every Jew. That no matter who you are and what your behavior looks like and what your external is like, like you have a core that may not be obvious to the eye, but it carries potent, infinite energy. What we call etzem anasham. What's etzem? Chassidus uses the word etzem and giluyim. Giluyim is expression, it's definitions, it's conscious experiences. Etzem, we don't see, but it lies at the soul and heart. Yom Kippur, one Yom Kippur, the Baal Shem Tov and his students were studying. They were studying in, um, they were davening, I'm sorry, Yom Kippur. And the Baal Shem Tov said that particular Yom Kippur, there was a decree in heaven that had to be 
abolished, so they were crying to no avail. A farm boy walks in, he sees everyone crying, everyone praying. Now he was ignorant, illiterate, he couldn't read Hebrew. He was a farm boy. But in his sincerity, he sees everyone crying. What did he know? The call of a rooster from the farm. So he called out, Kukuriku, Kukuriku, Kukuriku. And with that, he pierced heaven. The Baal Shem Tev sensed it. That's an etzem. We all have our Kukurikus, despite what our externals may look like. That's what the Baal Shem Tev revealed. And when you reveal the etzem, and here, let us refer to the quotes in, your, in, the, in the companion guide here. In the words of the Baal Shem Tev, a fundamental teaching that when you touch the core, you touch everything. If you touch someone's nose, you touch someone's mouth, you eat a piece of food, these are all localized, specific experiences. You touch the core, it's like someone touches the love of your child, that consumes all of you. I think of it in, modern, in our contemporary terms, we go on Mifzat film or Mifzat Neshek. And you put up, so many people say, the person is not observant Jew. We're putting on film. What's his rest of his life look like? But a mitzvah is not just a mitzvah, and a Jew is not just a Jew. There's an etzim and a shom, both the etzim and the mitzvah and the etzim and the Jew. And when you touch that, you touch his core. And that can ignite an entire revolution, a flame, a core pilot flame that will change this person's life. Maybe not immediately. That's what etzim is. Looking into the core of things, the Baal Shem Tov also taught us that we have to think mission-centric. Why are we here? And the most powerful, powerful statement. HaKadosh Baruch Hu shiktar up on of the world. God sends a soul down to this world. Un lept zibetzik adar achzik yor, lived 70 or 80 years. Was der tachlis hakavonu von der shlichis. The ultimate purpose of this mission is to tona idna teve, it's to do a Jew a favor. In Gashmias bechlal, or neruchnias befrat. In the material in general, and specifically in the spiritual realm. The Rebbe calls this a maimer nifle, vayeshev tov shemem zayin. A wondrous, an awesome teaching. Why? Because you can be a shemer teire mitzvahs, Quran tefillin, keep Shabbos, kashrus, everything. But that's not why your neshama may have come down here. Once you're here, obviously you have to do all the Teda and Mitzvahs. Your Neshama came down to do a favor. How do we live with this words? Very simple. We meet people all the time. It could be in a subway. It could be on a plane. It could be in the street. It could be a friend. It could be a stranger. This may be the person that you were sent to this world to help. It may not even be a person you like. Maybe a person that you may be turned off by. But this eliminates the whole idea of judgmentalism and condescension that is such a plague in our times because that person may be why you are here, to do a favor. So the Baal have created the revolution to look at the world through a new prism, through a new lens, the lens of etzem, the lens of the core, that there's something going on beneath the surface. What you see is not what you get. And that should infuse us to look at life as a mission to reveal the divine in every detail of our lives. And this would set the stage to all the other next generations of Chassidus, which all came, spreading the wellsprings, as Mashiach told the Baal Shem Tev, that when you, when, when your wellsprings will be spread to the farthest outskirts, that's when I will come. Because it's transforming the world and making it a world where there's a total fusion of the divine and existence without any separation. So now let's continue the journey, the journey into the books, the Sfarim, and the Neshama of the Magid of Mezrij. So the Magid assumes leadership a year after the Histalkus of the Baal Shem Tev in 1761, and it would span till 1772. And his times, of course, continued the events in the world as the as took place in the time of the Baal Shem Tev. What the Magid did was further develop these ideas. Now remember, both the Magid and the, uh, the Baal Shem Tev taught their Tehras in very short, they're very brief. And they taught them orally, they were not printed. 
In the case of the Baal Shem Tov, they were collected by t students over the years, and we have them today in the Sefer called Keser Shem Tov and Savor Sarivosh. Case of the Magid, same. Short Titus said orally and documented by his students in, again, we have them collected in two Sfarim. One is called Lakute Amorim, or also called Magid Varal the Yaakov, which is an acronym. Its last letters is the name of the Magid, Dev. And the second, Eir Teira. And he further developed these ideas, and of course, inspiring even more people and more people who would become leaders. And among his teachings, one of the things in the words of the, Baal, of the Magid, going back to the companion guide. Kesef. This is a verse in Baal Eischa, which is a mitzvah, to craft, make trumpets, two silver trumpets. Says the Magid, in his novel interpretation, what's the word chatzetzis? It also consists of two words. Chetzitzudas, two halves of an image. And who are the two halves? Hainu HaKadosh Baruch Hu Uknesis Yisrael, God and the Jewish people. Him kavyoch chetzitzudas shemashlimim zeh They are two halves of one whole entity and they complement each other. This is such a fundamental teira that the Rebbe Rashab in his magnum opus called Hemshech Ayim Beis, a third of it, 558 pages of Ayim Beis comes to explain these few lines. And what is the Magid telling us? He's taken the Baal Shem Tov's teachings even further. It's not just there's the vine and everything. We're partners with God. Kav Yochel Chetzitzuras, like two halves of one whole. One is not complete without the other. And then he goes on to say that God then created the universe through tzimtzumim, concealment after concealment. But the partner, we, the second partner, are meant to now reverse the process, not to be deceived by this concealment and see it for what it is, a challenge for us to find the divine that's concealed there. And we reverse the process and climb the ladder and retrace the steps and rejoin with God in a fully revealed fashion. And this, as I said, is explained for hundreds of pages in I.M. Bayes. So check it out. The Magid further takes this even further. It's not just that we're partners. We actually have the power to control heaven itself. And he interprets, Dama Lamailim Rach, a mission in Pirkei chapter 2 that says, Know that which is above you. And here's how the Magid interprets it. He reads it a bit differently. Da, shakoma shalamayla. Everything that's above is hakol humimcha. It's all dependent on you. So we know what the Rambam says, that one action can tip the scale. But that's an action on earth. Here he's saying it affects all the heavens. A ripple effect, a butterfly effect, if you wish, that goes all the way to the highest levels. What kind of empowerment is that? You can imagine when Jews began to hear this in their circumstances and with all the dichotomies that I described and with all the demoralization, what kind of spirits it lifted up. The simcha, the joy, the passion, the love that this elicited from their neshamas. Now, Chassidus teaches us, beginning with the Baal Shem Tov and the Magid, that in addition to the teachings of the Rabbeim, there's also their songs. They both capture the souls of the Rabbeim in different ways. Friedrich Rebbe says something interesting. A teira from a Rebbe touches naran, nefesh ruch, neshama of the Rebbe. A nigin from a Rebbe touches his yechida. And indeed, the, the Baal Shem Tov and the Magid composed a nigin called Gimel Tenuas, three movements. The first movement composed by the Baal Shem Tov, the second one by the Magid, and the third one by the Alter Rebbe. And indeed, the Baal Shem Tov himself was known to be a great menagin. He could sing, the Friedrich Rebbe writes, in many different ways, different voices. And he stirred souls. Hishtapchus hanefesh, the outpouring of souls. Gimel Tenuas. Yeah. 
continues, the journey into the Sfarim and the soul of the Alter Rebbe, founder of Teich Sidis Chabad. Alter Rebbe assumed leadership and developed the teachings of Sidis Chabad in the year 1772. And his Nisias, his leadership would span until 1812.
And what did the Alter Rebbe offer us? What he did was, he developed a comprehensive blueprint. Taking the short tales of the Mag of the Basb Shemtev and the Magid, turning them and codifying them into an approach of study, of prayer, of meditation, of character development, and applying these, these abstract concepts in a way that each of us can comprehend them. Chabad, Chochmah bin Adas. And apply them to our personal lives. And hence, the Torah of the, of the Alter Rebbe is far more expansive than the Baal Shem Tev and the Magid. And just a short overview of this forum. Of course, Sefer Atanya, Torah Shep Ksav of Chesidus. This the Alter Rebbe himself wrote, as well as some other writings, Shulchan Aruch, El Chastal Many things were not published in the Alter Rebbe's lifetime, the Tanya was. But the bulk of the Chassidus of the Alter Rebbe were actually not written by the Alter Rebbe. They were written by Manichim. The Maimorim that he developed, that he said of Rishabis and Yom Tov and by Chassanus and so on. They were written by Manichim. Maniach is someone who commits to paper that which he heard. The Alter Rebbe had primarily five Manichim. His brother, Mariel, Rabbi Yehud Leib, His son, the Mitla Rebbe, who would become the Mitla Rebbe. Another son, Rab Moshe, Rab Pinchas Rezes, and the Tzemach Tzedek in the time when he was able to begin documenting and writing down these Maimori. And this turned into an entire corpus of writings. We call it Maimori Ad Mura Zokin. It consists of over 20 volumes covering the Pashas, covering the holidays, as well as different occasions. And what do these teachings t contain? They take chassidus, and as I said, turn it into an intellectual and emotional process. Now, some may wonder, is this not somewhat compromising? The passion and the spark ignited by the Baal Shem Tov, the Etzem. As a matter of fact, some of the Alter Rebbe's colleagues criticized him for that. Some compared it to like a gun. It's loaded, you have everything there but the spark. Because you're turning chassidus into another academic exercise. The whole point of the Baal Shem Tov was to touch the etzem, the joy, the raw passion. That's even in a simple Jew. But in a very powerful mimer, Yutes Kislev Poder V'Shalom Tafresh Pehe, the Friedrich Rebbe, in the name of his father, the Rebbe Rashab, explains, are quite the contrary. To be able to take these fundamental principles that are coming from places that are undefined and inexpressible, the etzem, and put that into words that we can all understand requires going even deeper into the etzem, deeper into the core teachings. To put it simply, when you love someone, when you love something, you don't want to just love it in the instance of your soul, you want to love it in every fiber of your being, in your mind, in your heart, in your thought, speech, and action. And you want to understand as much as you can the love of God that the Baal Shem Tov, the Magid taught, coming down into the specifics that we can understand it with our rational minds was not bringing it down into trying to understand God. On the contrary, the love is so deep that it could even permeate intelligence and emotions and our day-to-day -day thought, speech, and actions. And the book of Tanya, the Sefer Tanya, the Kaddisha, and the other Maimorim, the Alter Rebbe develops this into a full comprehensive system. What is the purpose of our existence, writes the Alter Rebbe? V'zeh kol ha'odom v'tachlis b'riyose, u'briyas kol ha'elemis el'yenim v'tachtenim li'as le'dira zu b'tachtenim. The Rebbe chose this as one of the Yudbeis Pesuk Memore Chazal. Because this captures the idea that it's not just enough to have a relationship with God. Not just enough that the core soul is touched and has a kukuriku. But you have to come down into this world, in this material world, as the Alter Rebbe elaborates in chapter 36 in Tanya. Not in the spiritual worlds, in this material lowest of worlds and transform it. 
bringing the deepest levels of the divine in this world, and it's only in this world where we fulfill that desire. And this is not bringing it down, it's actually connecting it to the core essence as the Alter Rebbe continues in one of the classics, in a Geras HaKedah Simen Chav written just a few days before he passed away. The essence of God, the deepest essence of the divine itself. Everything in existence is created by the source, by the creator. Only one thing is not created, the creator himself. So what, from where does that existence come? It's called Mitsuyusei Matsmuse, it's self-generated. A reality that is real because it's real, not because someone put it here. So the Alter Rebbe continues. He's not an effect of any cause, God forbid, that put him here, God. And then this is the statement. That's why he has the power to create a yesh, like us, out of nowhere seemingly, that feels that an entity like ourselves that feels self-contained. We also don't feel anyone created us. You may understand that we do, but we don't feel we're an extension of someone. We're self-contained. Maybe we're self-made even. This was a revolutionary statement that Alta Friedrich Rebbe writes in the Kutta de Burim, that when the Chassidim heard this, they literally could not believe the radical Chiddush this was. And they celebrated in the streets. Why? Because we always saw the ego as being the root of all evil. The selfishness that the ego leads to. The ability to trample and hurt others. So you have to sublime the ego. And here the Alter Rebbe goes and says, the ego... The ego, the fact that we feel that we're self-made, actually is rooted in the divine essence itself. And the job and the mission is now to channel our egos to be channels of the divine ego. This is one of the biggest chedushim of the Alter Rebbe and Chassidus because it teaches us that our individuality is not a contradiction to God. It just has to be directed to the right end. The Yesh HaNivra becomes one with the Yesh HaMiti, a theme that you'll find very elaborated upon by the Rebbe based on these teachings of the Alter Rebbe. The Alter Rebbe said that as much as you comprehend God, you can't comprehend him as he is in his core essence, but a Nigan can help you reach that. That's why the Alter Rebbe explained to his Chassidim that if you want to understand Tanya, you need to have Nigina song. Pesach Tov Shindalet, the Friedrich Rebbe writes that. Famous when the Alter Rebbe went to Shklov, a city of great scholars, and he's recognized that as much as he'll explain things and debate with them, they won't get it. So he decided to sing a song. In some places, in Purim Tov Shachai says, the Rebbe says the song was, Tamuru'u kitev havaya fazuchten zet as the Rebbe said, is good. Taste and see that God is good. And when he sang the song, because it came from his, the essence of his heart, they flocked after him. The power of a song. And one of the ten songs of the Alter Rebbe is Keli Atta. Oh, you may make
So the next leg of our journey takes us into the Sfarim and the Neshama inscribed in the Sfarim of the Mitla Rebbe. The son of the Alta Rebbe assumes leadership in 1812 and his leadership would span until 1827. Now what's unique about the Mitla Rebbe is that in the world of Sfarim, he actually played a role very different than his father and the Baal Shem Tev as well. He was actually a publisher. He published his own works with introductions. He wrote them. He wrote all his own works. Obviously, there are also Hanochis of the Maimarim and discourses that were delivered. But the primary are his own published works. And perhaps the reason for that is because he's known to be the Bina of Chassidus. The Alter Rebbe is Chachma, a Nukuda. Relative to the Baal Shem Tov and the Magad, it's elaborate. But relative to the Mitla Rebbe, five pages of the Mitla Rebbe cover one page of the Alter Rebbe times, and sometimes even more. So publishing seems to be an expression of Bina, of expansion. expansion. And just to give a quick list of the Sfarim he published. The Sidrim Dach, he took the Maimorim of the Alter Rebbe and organized them around Sidr and published that. Biyuri HaZayar took the Alter Rebbe's Maimorim on Zayar and published that in a book. Imre Bina, Pirush HaMilis, Tera Chaim, Shari Eira, Ateres Reish, Shari Tshuva, Shari Amuna, Shari HaYichud, Pekeach Ivrim, Bad Kedesh. And of course, Teres Chaim, which is on Breshish and Shmois, elaborate Maimonim. He also some Sifrodim on Nigla, as all the Rabbeim did. And interesting to note, many of his Sifrodim are called Shar, gate. And in the Sifrodim themselves, he divides it by gates. What does a gate remind you of? Nun Shari Bina, the 50 gates of understanding. So wherever you turn, you see the Mitla Rebbe, the focus on Bina, playing a very specific role in this journey of Chassidus, taking the Nukudus, the more concentrated points of the Alter Rebbe, and turning them into elaborate discussions, literally sometimes spanning 50, 60 pages. There were my modem that Mitla Rebbe said that were hours long. There were times for bringing on Shabbos that he would say my modem to the point that some of the Chassidim and his own, his own uncle, the Maril, told him people can't handle it all. But it's a gigos and chassidus, basically. The Tzemach Tzaddik said that if you would cut my father-in-law, it was the Mitla Rebbe, you, blood wouldn't spurt, it would be chassidus. That was his life blood. And this is not just incidental, it's part of the process. In the words of the Mitla Rebbe, in Shari Yehud, he says, Yesh maila bihizbonanus derech prat. Contemplation, you can think about in general terms, a general idea. But then there is a quality and a virtue when it comes down into detail. Tafke. Mitzad eitzim akiru of gili eira leki benafshe yeser. Because when things are close to you, you're, it's, everything is in the details. It's not just a general picture. And he continues and says a very strong statement. When you just get a general picture of things, you may have a certain sense, but you can make a mistake. You could deceive yourself in thinking, you can, you can deceive yourself into thinking, you think you got it already. Sometimes you hear someone speak, I got it, I don't need to hear more. When it's a contemplation that goes into the details, then it gets infused within you in a permanent way. It's the details. The lesson that we live with in these living words of the Mitla Rebbe, God is in the details. Specifics. You think a detail is taking you away from the big picture? No. The big picture is really appreciated when you can understand every detail. Anything you really love, you want to know the details. You're not interested just in general. You want to know every detail because it touches the whole picture when you know those details. That's Bina. Chachm is a general picture, a concentrated point, and Bina develops it further. The Mitla Rebbe, one of his big things was 
to get create a communion among Chassidim, that they should talk to each other, they should fabring with each other. He was actually, he led, the Alter Rebbe had established that he should be like a mashpia to Chassidim. So you see that emphasis, a camaraderie, understanding the power of friendship. In a Yechidus, the Mitle Rebbe told an individual, as ret midem andren binyoni aveda, when one person speaks with another about service, serving God, issues around service, when they learn zusammen and they study together, is the zwei nefesh alekis, two divine souls, if ein nefesh abamis, against one animal soul. The Rebbe asked, why, why, is, why is that the case? Two divine souls against two animal souls. The Rebbe's answer is fascinating, because ein odem chete v'leilei, your animal soul doesn't care about someone else's animal soul. It's selfish. So you don't join. Divine souls are selfless. So when they come together, there's a synergy. The power of friendship, the power of two. A synergy where each of you complement each other. You get an objective, an opinion. You can give an objective opinion. So in addition to Asei L'charav, K'nei L'chachave. This is how we live with these words. Chassid is coming down in the most practical way in our social connections, having friends, having a support system. The Mitle Rebbe, translated in simple contemporary terms, was bringing chassidus, was bringing a lakus down to that level of our social interactions and our friendships. The Mitle Rebbe has a fascinating mimer in Teres Chaim at the end of Parsha Bereshis. He talks about music. Actually, you need to be a musician and appreciate the logic of music there. He talks about three beats, and four beats, all in the context that song, in the words of his father, the Alter Rebbe, is soul travel. If you want your neshama to travel, you need a song. A body travels with its legs, with a vehicle, but I want a neshama to travel. Kol bali ashir nechnosim b'shir v'yetsim b'shir. You need a song, a shir hamailas, the levim, to climb the 15 steps in the base of Midrash, you need to compose a song. A song touches you and can transport you to another time and place. And indeed, the Mitle Rebbe established a choir, a kapelya, that would compose and sing the gunim. So we'll sing the kapelya.
continues. Samach Tzedek, Sforim and the Neshama of the Samach Tzedek, third Chabad Rebbe. So now that the Alter Rebbe and the Mitla Rebbe established the Chochmem Bin of Chassidus, which teaches us how you bring the core essence of the divine, the core essence of a Neshama, into Giluim, into manifestation, all the way in Tachtenim, in this lowest of worlds. So it's a combination of the highest and the lowest. Comes the Tzemach Tzedek, who assumes leadership after the Histalkus of the Mitla Rebbe, 1827 to 1866. Tafresh Chavav. What did the Tzemach Tzedek contribute? The Tzemach Tzedek as Das of Chassidus, Chach Mabina Das, of Das, what he did was gathered all the Maimorim of the Alter Rebbe, turned it into an organized library structure, annotated it, cross-referenced it. And above all, he put it in context of all the Teir, literally, of all Pardis of Teir, Chumish, Teir Shebeksav, Teir Shebalpeh, Medrash, Zoyar, Kisve Arizal, Kabbalah. He attacked, connected all the Alter Rebbe's Teir and showed it how it contributes, and how it illuminates every other part of Teir. And this is in addition to the Maimorim that Alt Tzemach Tzedek himself wrote. So Tzemach Tzedek was a prolific writer, and his Maimorim, his Chassidus, you can say, breaks into four categories. One is the Hanochas that he wrote, or edited of the Alter Rebbe, or edited other Hanochas that I mentioned earlier, and from that, he gathered from over 2,000 discourses, he gathered that became the Sefer called Teira Eir and Lekut the Teira, published by the Tzemach Tzedek, to select my modem of the Alter Rebbe. Then there were his own my modem. Three were the Rishimas that he wrote. He wrote Sfarim, famous ones, Derech Mitzvah Secha, Sefer HaMitzvah, explaining mitzvahs according to Chassidus. Sefer HaKira was philosophical essays dealing with the debates of the time with those of the Enlightenment. Rishimus on Tehillim, commentary on Tehillim, Chassidusha commentary, and more. These are the Sfarim, but they're not just Sfarim as we know, these are lives. The soul of the Tzemach Tzedek. Just to give a quick example, there are two very classic discourses of the Tzemach Tzedek, one called Drush Gimel Minei Odom, one called Drush Gimel Shittis. These are principles of how to understand Seder Ishtalshlis, the cosmic order. And the ideas are scattered in many different discourses of the Alter Rebbe. 
Sambach Tzadik gathers it all together, connects it and grounds it with the writings of the Arizal, and gives us an elaborate map. If you want to have a map of Seder Ishtal you look into these by modern. You want to have a map into the great Kabbalistic arguments about the most important element of Sphiris, the interface between the divine and existence. And every interface needs to have some of one part and some of the other part. What represents the divine, what represents existence. So there are different opinions of the Kabbalists. Semach Tzedek meticulously explains each opinion and shows how different discourses of the Alter Rebbe lean toward one or opinion or another. So you have the context. One of the most powerful elements of applying chassidus to life is in one of the most famous expressions. And we'll read it from a letter from the Friedrich Rebbe. The Welt zockt. Sorry. An individual came to the Tzemach Tzedek, his child was very ill. Danger, very great danger, grave danger. This is the Tzemach Tzedek's words. Awaken the power of trust in God. With pure faith. God will save your son, spare your son. Thought helps. Think good and it will be good. And that's what happened. And the child was healed. Of course, we know this expression. The Rebbe uses it so often in letters and in answers. But it's not just a nice statement, have a nice attitude. It actually can change reality. So over a century before positive psychology would enter the mainstream, that Samach Tzedek is teaching this. Where does this come from in Chassidus? Because when you're connected to the soul and you're connected to God, you have resources that are far beyond your expectations. If you look at everything from surface level, yeah, someone's not well, someone's depressed, someone's suffering from this, someone's suffering from that. But when you dig deeper and you reveal the Neshama, which is what Chassidus does, then your thinking good will actually actualize new potentials, new possibilities. In continuing in the same vein, in a letter, a powerful letter that the Tzemach Tzedek writes, he writes, how our attitude can change our reality. You shouldn't talk about depressing thoughts. You have to always show and demonstrate joyous behavior, behavioral joy. As if you're actually joy, actually happy. Even though you don't feel it. Even though you don't feel in your heart happy, act happy and you become happy. And you'll end up being happy. What is the reason? Because according to your behavior and your actions, that a person actualizes, so actions cause feelings rather than the other way around. When you do it, then you'll begin to feel it. And then he continues in this letter a most powerful story, he relates. That the last night of the Alter Rebbe's life, it was Matsoy Shabbos. And a few hours after Havdalah, we know the Alter Rebbe would be in the Stalik. The Tzemach Tzedek was the Chazan for Maidiv that Shabbos. And Shabbos was ending. And he saw the matzav. He saw the situation with the Alter Rebbe. So he, when his davani, you can tell he was very depressed. He was very sad. He writes that my grandfather waited till I finished and then called me over and said that his great teacher, the Magid, teaches that God's face reflects our face. When you have a happy face below, God shines a happy countenance on you. When you have a sad face below, God shines a sad face. But he waited, he said. He waited till I finished. This is perhaps the last words uttered by the Alter Rebbe al in this world. Because right after that would be the Histalkus. That's how important it was. So it's not just abstract ideas. It actually comes down to how we behave and how we look at things. That there is no such thing as looking negatively. So some people think it's not realistic. You're being naive. I'm a realist. It's depressing. 
No, it's not, not realistic. It's seeing more than you see. What does our naked eye see? We only see the here and now. What do we know what's going on beneath the surface? Come to Rabbeim, comes at Tzemach Tzedek, the Alter Rebbe, and tells us there's much more going on beneath the surface. Access it, and it will change your life. I think the lesson of that is quite obvious in living the Torah of the Tzemach Tzedek. Nigan song does exactly that, which words can do. It touches us in a place that even if we may be down or feeling sad, it can take you to another place of joy. And indeed, the Tzemach Tzedek explains in Amaymer that the song is like a circle. It's infinite. When does the song end? You just stop it, but you can keep singing it in a circular way. It has no edges, it has no ends, because it touches the infinite, explains the Tzemach Tzedek. So the Tzemach Tzedek's nigan called Yemin Hashem. to leg six of the journey, the Rebbe Marash, the youngest son of the Tzemach Tzedek, assumes leadership. 1866, it would span for 17 years till 1882, to Tafresh Mem Gimel, beginning Tafresh Chavov. The Rebbe Marash, his time was marked by a great increase in tragic pogroms that ravaged the Jewish communities. So if ever were needed the spiritually uplifting and the hope-filled teachings of Chassidus, who was at that point. And indeed, the Rebbe Marash, expanding upon the Tzemach Tzedek, his father, and the Rabbeim before him, took Chassidus to a new generation. He began developing it into discourses and ideas 
that far easier for contemporary people like ourselves to understand. Not that we can't understand the Tzemach Tzedek and the ones before, the Mitle Rebbe and the Alter Rebbe, but this is clearly, you see, far more structured. Indeed, he also introduced the concept of Hemshechim. What's a Hemshech? Until that point, every Reb Mimer that a Rebbe said was an individual Mimer, said on a certain Shabbos, on a Yontif, had a beginning and an end, some were longer, some were shorter. A Hemshech is a series, a series of Mimerim that cover a central theme and could span for weeks and weeks, months and months, even years. Some go for a year or two years. Famous Hemshechim of the Reb Marash, Mayim Rabim Tofresh Lamed Vov, 1876. V'kocha, Tofresh Lamed Zayin, 1877. V'hechrim, Tofresh Lamed Ches, 1878. And more. That allowed for a certain expansiveness because you can take an idea and develop it over weeks, over months, over years. Reb Marash. The Rebbe categorized the Rebbe Marash with a very specific term, which helps us understand more of the Neshama and the essence of the Rebbe Marash was two words, L'chathchila Ariber, based on an expression in the words of the Rebbe Marash. The world zokt al mekenet arunter darf men ariber. The world says that if you can't go below, then you go above. Ich und ich halt. I say, I feel, I hold. As medaf l'chathchila ariber. We have to go initially, not only as a last resort. Initially, we begin from above. Medaf l'chathchila nemen mit starkeit. You have to begin with strength. Not to be affected or impacted by anything. To fulfill the intended and respective mission. And when you go with that approach, God helps. That's the full expression. The Friedrich Rebbe actually writes, in following up these words, he says, this became a yusod etzli. This became a foundation in my life, the Friedrich Rebbe says. And when I was faced with detractors, with naysayers, with people who try to cool off my ideas, I remember these words of the Reb Marash. This takes Trachgut Vedzangut to a whole other dimension. Think big. Don't look at it, okay, I'll make a plan. If it doesn't work, I'll make a bigger plan. No, go into the porch and entirely. It's a lesson in leadership. It's a lesson in building something. It's a lesson in success. Look at successful people. That's how they think. I don't know if they heard the Rebbe Marash, but he definitely infused the concept in this in the stratosphere, and therefore many people begin to think like that. But it's not just thinking, it's an attitude that can change a lot. We all have naysay, we all have people, you have an idea, you're inspired, you're excited, you're idealistic. So it says, it's not gonna work. You know, I'm sure you could always find in your Rolodex, contact list, what they call today, people, as soon as you're excited, they'll be the first to tell you, why it's not going to work. That we tried it, the more things change, the more they stay the same, the cynicism, skepticism. The Rebbe writes in a note to someone that people who themselves are failures want everyone else to be a failure, so they shouldn't stand out. So the an approach. Obviously, you have to make sure it's the right thing you're doing, but you go with that starkeit, you go with that confidence. You think big. In a Maimer, a very famous, powerful Maimer, called Mika Moicha Tofresh Choftes, from the Rebbe Marash. He says something the Rebbe cites very often, reading from the Rebbe Marash's words. Mitzias ha'elam v'chol ma'sha nivruhu, mitzias. Everything in creation is actually exists. She'im nemesh ha'zeo rak ma'sha nidmalanu. If we think it's only an illusion, that existence is only illusion, im ke ma'u she'kosa b'reish yizbara. So what is the meaning of the Pasuk that says God created heaven and earth? It's only an illusion. If existence is an illusion, there's no reward and punishment. There's no Teir and Mitzvah. And that is impossible. We cannot say that. The truth is existence is a Mitzvah. Now many of us ask the question, what kind of mean? Who thinks the world is an illusion? We all think it's real. Someone insults you, you sure think it's real. But there were philosophers 
that actually said that maybe the entire world is an illusion and any proof you bring is part of the illusion. So it's not necessarily a proof. Now actually, Chassidus would perhaps agree with them based on the principle that existence, as the Alter Rebbe brings in Shari Yechid Vamuna, cited earlier, its only existence is because of the divine energy within it. It has no real substance. However, the Teda tells us that the world exists. That's the proof. Not because we see a world. Well, seeing is not necessarily believing. There are illusions that some of the Rebbe Maharaj brings a magician has a sleight of hand, maybe the world is a sleight of hand. But the Teda says so. So the entire existence of the world is a Teda world. Now this Maimer, the Rebbe Marash repeated 14 times in Hayyem Yem. It says that the Rebbeim had Maimorim, they would repeat many times, Lezachich, Letayir Avir, to purify, to refine the environment. Perhaps the Rebbe Marash, seeing the rise of secularism, seeing the rise of the self-made man, of the fountainhead, of that type of arrogance, said this by Morim so many times because he wanted to weaken that illusion that people think reality is real because I think it's real. No, it's real because God says it's real, because the Torah says it's real. Which is the lesson that complements L'Chadchil Eribar. Many times we think, what are people going to say? What is the world going to say? The world has no value except because God gave it value because he said, Bereish is Bore Lakim. So it gives us a way of looking at the world. Yes, there's a world because God said so, but not because it has any power of its own. That's what this Maimur teaches us. It's an attitude. And you see indeed the Rabbeim, how they apply that in every situation, as the Friedrich Rebbe said, not to be nispal from what others say. The world has no validity without the Teda. All it is is a platform, a stage for us to express Teda and Yiddishkeit and Chassidus in this world. At the Sheva Brachis of the, of the Rebbe Rashab, the Rebbe Marash called and announced that some of the singers who can sing a particular song, we don't know which song it was, should come together and sing together. But in order to keep them coordinated, he asked two of the Chassidim, who were major singers, to come up, he says, to kum o, o, e benuf, meaning to come up not on the stage, but to stand in a way that it would lead the song that it should be coordinated. So we'll now sing L'Chadchila Ariber. That's the name the Rebbe gave to the song. It used to be called Ein Svei Dreifir. L'Chadchila Ariber. Because the song itself captures this theme of think big, of looking at things from the top and not going from the bottom up. <laughs> Oh, you know. 
Shab and his forim son of the Rebbe Marash assumes leadership in 1882 and this would enter and take us into the 20th century. This may be the most tumultuous period in history, including Jewish history. Everything would change in these years. The Russian Revolution leading to World War I, World War II. Chabad, the Rebbe Rashab was compelled to move from Labavitch, which was the headquarters of Chabad for 102 years from the Mittler Rebbe's times to move to Rostov because of the war. World War II, we know what that was about. Everything would change. And the Rebbe Rashab, in the spirit of his predecessors, took on the challenge and developed Chassidus in a completely new way. He's called the Rambam of Chassidus, like the Rambam who codified and took all the chassidus, all the tail and turned it into sugyas, to organize structure. That's what the Rebbe Rashab did. Through his individual maimarim and particularly through his hemshechim, and specifically the famous hemshech tofre samagvov, delivered, beginning to be delivered in 1905, and hemshech hayim beiz, begin the delivery in 1912. These are spanned for years and developed the ideas of chassidus that our understanding of chassidus today comes primarily the way the Rebbe Rashab explains it in elaborate detail. And it could be this was countering the darkness that was beginning to consume the world and the Jewish nation as well. In the beginning of Samachvov, the Rebbe Rashab begins discussing why do we exist, the purpose of existence, why were we created? He first cites the many different opinions, Kabbalists, the sages, and then says, but the ultimate reason is, Nesav HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God desired, to have a home in this lowest of worlds. This is not to do anything that compelled, and no to no logical reason. That's what he desired. And he quotes this powerful statement from the Alter Rebbe, Kumash Omer Abbeinu Zal, the Alter Rebbe, on a desire, there's no question. Obviously, this is just a word we can use, kavyochal desire, because it's the closest thing for us to understand something that is not bound to logic. Now, many people wonder what this means. Would God just have his desire out of the blue? This is a desire that transcends logic. Remember, there is no logic until God creates logic. This te teaches us that existence itself is rooted not in a logical reason, which would mean some expression of the divine. It fills a need. God wants to be benevolent. God wants to express himself. He wants us to be able to receive his glory. 
These are all reasons, logical reasons. But the existence is grounded and rooted in the highest, deepest levels of the divine essence. Going back to the etzem that the Baal Shem Tev first began teaching. And that etzem is dafke betachtein. It's fulfilled dafke in this world and only in this world, not in the higher worlds. So this teaches us that when we're doing a small detail in this material world, it's not just a trivial matter. This detail is touching the taiva of the Abish to himself, not bound, he didn't have to do it. It's not for a reason, it's not fulfilling a need, it's because that's what he wants. And we have the power to fulfill that for no particular reason and for no explanation. What we know is that's what he wants, we don't know why he wants it because there is no why. It's beyond the why. In preparing for the challenges and the, tri and the tribulations the Jews would be going through in the next years, and we all know what happened in those years, 1920, what it would lead to, uh, Rebbe Rashab did something extremely revolutionary. He established a yeshiva, not that his father did not do, his grandfather didn't do, the Alter Rebbe, and he says that it is a gewalget. I went to the oil years and years because I, I, how could I do something my predecessors didn't do? But then he established in 1897 in Tafresh Nun Zayin, and he explains why. He explains why. He explains that this is essentially a training ground. It's not just to study Torah, that of course. Not just to bring up Yerush Shemaim, but a training ground to train a new army. A new army that would be spiritual soldiers that would go out in the front and fight the winds of assimilation, of apostasy, the winds of, that were going to consume the world in denying belief and denying God. All the forces we see today, the Rebbe Rashab, in his visionary way, prescient, he saw what was coming and he established the yeshiva. Of course, then it was not yet easy to develop it, but the Friedrich Rebbe and the Rebbe developed it into an army. Every Chabad house on earth is a product of this training ground that the Rebbe Rashab established at the end of the 19th century. And in the year Tofre Samachal of Simchas Teda, this would be 1900, he said a classic talk to the students, to the yeshiva. He said, Kol David. All those that go out in the war of the house of David, case of Get Christus Ishte, as he explains, have to separate themselves from material commitments. They have to be completely dedicated to the cause. What is Beis David? Is the Gilui from Mashiach ben David. The Yefutsu Maynasecha Chutza. Beis David is Geula. Yefutsu Maynasecha Chutza, which would bring the Geula, as Mashiach said. That bring and be as a Mashiach. But thus is the Beis David, the Gilui Eir from Mashiach ben David. And with this, he empowered not just that generation, generations to come. So when you think about it, as I said, the Chabad houses, Wherever they are, whatever they're doing, with that attitude, are trained in this military academy, but it's a spiritual academy. That one that teaches us that we're here to transform the world, no matter how secular it is, to transform it into Adira B'Tachtenu. The Rebbe Rashab said, every door has a key, but then there's a master key that opens all doors. Anigan. The Nigan of the Rebbe Rashab, Nigan Achona.
Friede Kerebe, the journey into his forum, his neshama. The Friede Kerebe assumed leadership from the Ben Yochid of the Rebbe Rashab, 1920, and that would span till 1950, till Tavshin Yud. <clears throat> the Friede Kerebe's lifetime and his leadership, we all know, was not easy. It was marked by Mesidus Nefesh and by radical transitions. And whatever was happening in the Rebbe Rashab's times now came to fruition. 1920, the Bolshevik Revolution. And you can say it breaks into three decades, three stages, as the Rebbe explains. 1920 to 1930, Friedrich Rebbe, most of those years, was in the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union. The Bolsheviks did everything possible to eradicate Judaism. And the Friedrich Rebbe stood up to the point that he was arrested in 1927 and miraculously released, miraculously. But this would change radically the life of Jews in Russia. And Friedrich Rebbe was forced to leave. He didn't want to. The next decade, 1930 to 1940, he was in Warsaw and Poland in Riga, Latvia. And this was, of course, the time when Nazism was coming to the fore. Whatever Stalin was, Yamach Shema, the Nazis were far worse. Or maybe they're comparable. And this was the Friedrich Rebbe dealing with those challenges. And then had to leave a middle, almost the last ship out of Riga to America and coming in 1940 to America, the first half of that decade was, of course, the decimation of our Jewish people in Europe. We can only imagine what the Friedrich Rebbe went through. And the second half, 1945 after the war was beginning to rebuild Judaism with everybody saying it's impossible, especially in America. Friedrich Rebbe saying America is not different. We're going to rebuild Judaism here. But it wasn't just a rebuilding. It was reinvigorating a demoralized people. You can imagine what the mood was like in 1945. But the Friedrich Rebbe in that resolute will of a Rebbe armed the arsenal of Chassidus all this time, from 1920 to 1950, it never stopped saying or teaching and delivering chassidus. You would think, we're under the gun, running for our lives. No. He delivered my marim, and he wrote my marim. He wrote most of his own discourses. Some were memorized by Manichim, Chesim, and then written down. But most he wrote. It's even hard to imagine. How was he writing under the gun? In the years that were really horrible years. But he did. Because he knew... The Chassidus is the antidote to all these difficulties. And he knew better than anyone that within every darkness lies the greatest light. And he had that attitude. And that's what his Chassidus taught. I want to read a mimer. This is, mind you, written in 1933, delivered in 1933, literally in the wake and the shadow of the fires that would consume Europe. The Friedrich Rebbe says, writes, very abstract, but very powerful statement. Context. We know nothing creates itself. Everything has a source. A building has an architect. A song has a composer. A book has an author. A world like ours has a creator. So nothing is mitzadatzme. Everything has a source. He's saying ruchni is too. Not just physical matter. Even sublime things, even ideas, even spiritual concepts, spiritual reality, spiritual realms has a source. Everything comes from its source. However, the value of a spiritual entity is it has its own inherent value. What does that mean? In the physical world, both its existence and its value is all from a source. It doesn't have anything of its own. In spiritual realm, its existence comes from a source, but its value does not. So the Friedrich Rebbe explains, being that it's soul, it's sublime, and it doesn't have any substance of its own, therefore, that's its inherent value. Because the more you're mavatlit, and the Rebbe once said an expression, you can destroy everything except something that's already self-effacing, self because the more you mavatle, the stronger it becomes. So bitl, or ruchnius, because it recognizes its source, 
That itself gives it value. Gashmis does not recognize its source. See the far-reaching implications of that? The Rebbe has a footnote there, worth studying, very deep. He begins an example in Nigel and Machsis Ashekel, not for now. But one has to wonder why the Friedrich Rebbe in these difficult times would say my modem like that. And perhaps we can say, because he, in seeing the evils that were emerging, which all come from the yesh of this world, the yeshes of this world, the darkness, that he felt it was important to go back into the engineering room and dissect the very engineering of what defines Gashmias in some way to weaken its hold. Obviously, what Nazi Europe did was not, was not upheld by the Friedrich Rebbe, meaning he did not stop it from happening. But still, he felt in some way he has to weaken his hold and give Ruchnius its real right. And when we look now, who prevailed, even though then it was so difficult, Chassidus prevailed, Tera prevailed. Now the Friedrich Rebbe, in a similar way, interestingly, in the first discourse he ever delivered is Maimer that he wrote and said literally days after the Rebbe Rasha passed away, Reish is going Amolek, the Rabbeim would say the same Maimer they began with, with Maimer, the last Maimer that the Rebbe before him said, the Rebbe Rashab's last Maimer was Reish is going Amolek, Friedrich Rebbe. And he talks here about a Rebbe. He says, Kedusha leizazim im kema. Holiness is permanent. It never leaves its pace. It, when it's, once it's there, it's there forever. The place where a tzaddik studied Torah and served God, the Kol Kalov and all his utensils and all his furniture, if you wish, all his belongings, that he used, meaning his table and his chairs and so on, they always remain, the Kedusha always remains, because it's part of his mission to refine that part of the world. This is where the Rebbe says the expression that the Friedrich Rebbe was 10 years in a location, 770. That location is forever changed. But then the Friedrich Rebbe goes on and tells a story. He says, when I was five or six years old, in Ran Tofresh Mem Heyor Memvov, I was in the room of Yechidus where my grandfather would have his personal, library, his personal office. And my father, the Rebbe Rashab, after the Histalkas, the passing of the Rebbe Marash, came in, dressed with his gartel, stood at the table, his lips were whispering something, Obocha Harbe. And he cried, he cried tremendously. Essentially, that he saw with his own eyes how the Rebbe's table and chair and the Rebbe lives on. You can imagine why he would say that in the first Maimon because that would empower him and the chassidim with what we've been talking about the theme of this evening. What better expression of hey Tevis is this? That the words and the Torah lives on because they're, the neshama of the Rebbe is invested, infused, inscribed in these words, and they live on. And the Friedrich Rebbe felt it necessary to make that statement. In Tovshin Mem Zayin, Parsha Vayikra, the year when this of Hey Tevis, 33 years ago, a few months after the verdict came out of Hey Tevis, the Rebbe says a very powerful Sikha Vayikra Tovshin Mem Zayin and speaks and cites this entire discourse, this section of it rather, about the Nitzchias of Nisim, that what they represent is forever, but it's in our hands because we make them live on. Mazari b'chaim, afu b'chaim. So the living lesson of this to all of us is very straightforward. It's the Heitavis lesson. The Rebbe once said in the Fabrengen, when the Friedrich Rebbe was here physically, he controlled his destiny. And now we control his destiny. Because when we learn this for him, and we live with him, and they become living example for how we should live, that brings the Rebbe alive. And I don't want to repeat the second half of it. So the lesson is very clear, especially on this special day. The Friedrich Rebbe, of course, had his special nigunim, and one that stood out was called the Benini. So now let us connect to the nigun, which, as I said, is kulmas halev. It's the quill of the soul that touches us in ways that words cannot.
come to the last leg of this glorious and revolutionary journey. The Rebbe, our Rebbe, assuming leadership in Tovshin Yud, 1950. In the aftermath of World War II, the rebuilding of Yiddishkeit, and everything we know up till this very day, and the Rebbe, in his own inimitable style, took all the chassidus of the eight generations before the Rebbe being the ninth generation from the Baal Shem Tov, the seventh generation from the Alter Rebbe, and turned it into a blueprint that we can use today to deal with every issue and challenge facing the Jewish people and the world, even till this very day in the 21st century. And how did the Rebbe do this? What did his Torah look like? Compared to all the other Rabbeim, it's incomparable. The volume, the sheer volume. As much as was written and developed by the previous Rebbes, the Rebbe took it to another level. Interestingly, most of the Rebbe's Torah was delivered orally, similar to the Baal Shem Tev and the Magid and then somewhat the Alter Rebbe. However, it was very different, it wasn't short literally thousands and thousands of hours, yielding tens and tens of thousands of pages, no exaggeration, in the long Fabrengens, starting from 1950, spanning till 1992. 
So just a short description of this work. These talks delivered by Fabrengens were written down by Manichim, as were done by the previous generations. But here, the job was much greater because so much of it was said and not written by the Rebbe. People who would commit it to paper, some of it the Rebbe had edited, and they would be called Mugadika Sichas. They were random, they were sporadic. In 1987, Tov Shemem Zayin, the Rebbe began editing them regularly. So they became what we call today the Sefer HaSichas, Tov Shemem Zayin, two volumes, Tov Shemem Ches, all the way through Tov Shemem Bey's 1992. <coughs> Edited Fabrengens, almost complete Fabrengens. There was also Maimorim that Rebbe delivered, official Maimorim, Divrei Elikim Chayim. Think of the name, the words of the living God. Again, living words, not just words, living words. Divine living words. And the Rebbe delivered by Marim. Again, most were not edited, but some were, and they ultimately became a series called Sefer My Marim Malukit. Six volumes, and later turned into volumes that are in the order of the Pashas or the holidays. The edited ones. Then we have Lukute Sichas. What's Lukute Sichas? Lukute Sichas is as its name implies. It's a Likut, it's a selection. It's not a whole Fabrengen, it's a thought or a talk on a Rashi and a Rambam on a zayar, an idea, on a holiday. So it's one section, and the Rebbe edited all the Kutesichas, which now consists of 39 volumes, edited talks. And this is not even counting the over 30 plus volumes of Igris Kedish, the Rebbe's letters in Hebrew and Yiddish, and there's still letters in the Rebbe in English that have not been published. And then there's, of course, things the Rebbe wrote himself. We have the Rishimis, manuscripts of the Rebbe that the Rebbe wrote from early years long before he became Rebbe. We have, of course, Hayyim Yim. We have the Haggadah Shal Pesach. And we have Tshuva Sabayurim. These are answers the Rebbe answered to people who ask questions. This is just a little taste. So you could see the sheer volume. Giving us the tools, because that's what it comes down to, the tools, to deal with all the challenges of this complex world in which we live. Now, what is the theme of these teachings? Obviously, we don't have the scope to go over everything, but going back to the central theme of Chassidus, taking the etzem and bringing it into Giluim all the way to the lowest levels. In simple English, taking the undefined, superconscious states that go all the way up to the essence of the divine itself that's beyond words, beyond expression, beyond explanation and reason, and experience it in a very tangible and concrete way in this world, transforming this world into Adiri B'Tachtein. The Rebbe took it to another dimension, talking about Atzmus, was not so common in the previous Rabbeim's teachings. By the Rebbe, he went into ways that are unprecedented, understanding Atzmus as beyond any questions. We can ask questions beyond logic. There are profound sikhs of the Rebbe talking about Atzmus. And then the other extreme, taking those highest sublime levels and bringing it into practical. The Rebbe talks to, sikh, to children, the Mifzoyim, the yud Beis Psukim, and of course, Shlichus itself. Now, a central theme in the Rebbe's teachings, because the Rebbe wanted to integrate it. Remember, this is the last leg of the journey, the leg that leads us to Mashiach. So integration is critical. It can't just be something that's being transmitted from above as a gift. We have to be part of the process or else it's not internalized. A central theme in the Rebbe's talks that has to be internalized. The deepest levels internalized. So in one of the powerful talks that Rebbe delivered when he turned 70 years old, Yud Aleph Nisan Tov Shalamit Beis. And he was being, he said that people are writing letters that he should retire. So the Rebbe in his own unique and in a slightly humorous way went the other extreme. Not only am I not retiring, we're just beginning. And I'm going to show you that the most important thing for a person in this world is to put in effort, not just to relax. So let's read. God established the order of creation. As the men that a person's needs should not come ready, made. Nor dafke durch omel via dafke through exertion and effort. Because we want him to lift himself up to be a mashpia, a giver. 
Umahava, a creator, Deimelebede, to be like the creator, not a receiver, but a giver. Through the fact that a person struggles and builds on his own. A central theme in the Rebbe's Fabrengen's, every Fabrengen, you see that message. Starting from the first official Fabrengen after the Maim Rebbe Gani, Tovshin Yudalef, the Rebbe said, Don't deceive yourself in thinking I'm going to do the job for you. You have to do your effort, and then I will help you. This was central. But this isn't just a nice idea. It's fundamental to the internalization because you cannot have godliness in our lives if it's given to you as a gift. Then it's not ours. We don't own it. What the Rebbe was doing with this was teaching us to be leaders, to be proactive. We're not bystanders or spectators. When I turned bar mitzvah in Tov Shalamit, Simchas Teda, so as a child in Crown Heights, I used to always be by the Rebbe's dancing Simchas Teda HaKofas under the tables with the children. Okay, now I'm turning by mitzvah, now I'm an adult. I'm still not an adult, but I thought I was an adult then. And they put on this big hat on my head, and I was so proud. Come Simchas Teda, I'm not going under a table. I stood with one of my uncles in the bleachers. That's where the adult stood. After the first HaKofa, the Rebbe turns to my father and says, where's your son? He would always dance with us down here. So my father proudly points to me standing in the bleachers. And the Rebbe smiles and says, no, spectator. He also now became a spectator. So you can imagine, they made sure I went down to the floor. And all the Bochrim that year who heard that no longer stood in bleachers. But the Rebbe, the bleachers were spectators. We're not bystanders or spectators. We are, we make things happen. We don't wait. This is the empowerment of the Rebbe to our generation to be leaders. Every shliach, and many on their natural leader will tell you, I'm not a natural leader. I don't know what I would have been. But the Rebbe, that's what he insisted. Everybody is a leader in their own way. You take the initiative. You don't wait. The best defense is offense. This dramatically affected our entire generation. Because who would we be without that attitude? And look what it accomplished. Leadership. Aveda Bekeyachatzme. And today, more than ever, after Gimel Thomas, 25 years, in a tragic way, it's so apparent. It is in our hands right now. Because Kavyachl, so to speak, we can't depend on Giluim from above. We hope we could. And we, God, we hope and pray that God should have Rachmanes, that Rebbe should have Rachmanes, and just lead us out of Golas. But as long as we're here, we were charged with a mission. We're not waiting on the sideline. You have to do what you can do. And this leads us to the most important of all, the actual mission of this generation, which the Rebbe stated right at the outset in his first official discourse, Bosse Ligani Tovshin Yud Aleph. One small segment. And this is what is demanded of every individual, or you can say, of us from the seventh generation, seventh generation of this journey of the Balta Rebbe, from the Alta Rebbe, the Kol and Chavivim. All sevens are precious. Even though the mere fact that we're the seventh generation is not necessarily, well, it doesn't say not necessarily, it says it's not based on our choice and our service and our effort. And in many ways, or in several ways possibly, it's we don't even want it. Nevertheless, that's a fact. It's the set, all sevens are precious. We find ourselves now in the footsteps of Mashiach, at the end of the process. And what is our work? The work of the seventh generation, similar to the seventh generation of Moshe from Avram Avinu, to finish the job, the job of bringing the Shekhinah down below. And not just the Shekhinah, we talked about the highest levels. As the Rebbe explains in the Maimer, the highest levels before the Tzimtzum all the way to the Etzim. The two extremes, from the highest down below. That's our job, to finish 
the seven generations from the Altar Rebbe, the nine generations from the Baal Shem Tov, the 90 generations from Moshe Rabbeinu, and you could say the generations back from the beginning of time when Odom and, Rish and Chava were put into Gan Eden. We are now in the time we're finishing a process, a journey, a marathon that's been going for so many years. You can't take this lightly. This is the mission. And the mission continues to be part of this generation of ours. And we have a role to play. It's not just we're reading words. 40 years later, Chofches Nissen, Tavshin Nun Aleph. 40 years from Tavshin Yud Aleph, the famous emotional plea from the Rebbe. And this, these three lines capture it powerfully. Hadover hayechidi sheyechel nilases. The only thing I can do, this is after the Rebbe saying, I did everything I can all through these 40 years. To give it over to you. Do everything in your power. Things that are radical, that may be considered wild. But they have to be presented in a civil way, in a way that people can receive them. Lahovi bepeles Mashiach said, "Kano take it from Yad Mamish." All underlined, to actually bring bepel, take it from Yad Mamish Mashiach. Exactly what he said 40 years ago, where we began the seventh generation. He said now, 40 years later, in this famous sikh. Put him Tavshem Emzayin. Interestingly, just a month or two after Hey Tavis, when the verdict was released, the Rebbe said basically the same idea in a long fabring and put him Tavshem Emzayin, that it went over from the Nosi to you. The ultimate Aveda Bekeyachatzme. Of course, we would not want it that way. The Rebbe says himself, it's not in our Pchira, it's not our Aveda, and it's not even our will. Who wants it? The Rebbe should take care of it. Why suddenly drop, dropping a job on us? But whether we like it or not, this is the story. There's something we must do. So I would say, Hey Tavis, the holiday of Hey Tavis, the Esrotzen and James Gula. Today is probably more powerful than ever. When it happened in Tavshim Shemem Zion, the Rebbe was a full glory, Nosi Begoli in every possible way. Today, that's concealed from us. And today, Hey Tavis reigns supreme, that a Rebbe lives on, his words live on, but with one condition, that we make it living, but we internalize it and we live with it. And Achmon al-Islam, when we don't, in a way, it adds to the concealment. So I want to just conclude with this. The Rebbe, the thousands of hours that he sat and he poured out his heart and soul trying to knellem, trying to get the message across to us. I'm not going to be derogatory about who we are. The relentlessness, the passion, the stubbornness. He would not give up no matter who he was dealing with. Thousands of hours. We could see, you could see it. I saw it live. You could see it in recordings. You could see it in the words. Many hours arguing with God. Everything that ever poured out, the Mesiris Nefesh that he invested in reaching the end, yes, the end of the process, the Gu'ula. That's what the Rebbe wanted. Anything less was not enough. So I would say that it would be a disgrace if we don't do our part, because if we don't do it, Kav the Rebbe said, this is our job. How could we let him down? I meet people. And they say, yeah, your Rebbe had a nice dream. It was very idealistic. Now you're one of us. You're waiting. It hurts me so terribly. It's like when the anti-Semites say, where's your God? We hate Tavis today have the responsibility to bring the Rabbeim alive through their words, through their teachings, by living it. And none of us can say we're too small. The Rebbe made it very clear. He negated every possibility. You could say, I didn't choose it. No one asked you. You didn't work for it. Again, no one asked you. You may not even want it. That's not the issue here. This is the job. Anyone that takes this somewhat seriously has to ask themselves, 25 years, what have we done? And where are we going? This is Hey Tavis living today. And that's why it was so important, that verdict, among many other reasons, 
to establish, even in a secular world, that a Rebbe lives on. He's not a private citizen. His books are not just books, they're lives. And the lives are in our hands because the Rebbe belongs to Chassidim. So Chassidim, whether we like it or not, in a way, control the Rebbe's destiny. So my question to myself and to all of us is what are we going to do with this? And for this, we were chosen. Ata v'chartono.